I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in me is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. City of Joy. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. I hope that you all are well and that you're experiencing God's goodness and his presence in your lives. Look, this past week was the first time we were able to meet physically in our joy communities. It was refreshing to see everyone and I'm looking forward to when we're able to meet again and I'm especially looking forward to when we could come together and worship corporately as a church. Once again, I'm thankful to be sharing the word with you this morning as we're nearing the conclusion of our series in Colossians, All Jesus Everything. Today I'll be sharing from just two verses, so hopefully this will be short and sweet. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Let's read this passage together. It says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, 
so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So I want to title this message, Walk the Talk. And as we get further into these verses, I believe the Holy Spirit will illuminate to us what he wants to say. But first, let me just give a brief paraphrase summary that will give context to this scripture. So in the beginning of the book of Colossians, Paul is communicating the essence of who Christ is and is exalting his supremacy above all. He essentially moves then to what Jesus is not by addressing the false ideologies that were floating in the church that mix parts of Christianity with man-made religion. Then he addresses their identity in Christ, which flows directly from his salvific work. Thanks, Matt Cowman. That's just a fancy word um, denoting his saving work on the cross and resurrection from the dead. Then he instructs them on how to live in light of all of this, which includes instructions on righteous living, marriage, and relationships. So this brings us to the point we are now. So in the previous verses, Paul just asked them to pray that the Lord opened the door for him to continue sharing the hope of Jesus, which our brother Pastor Kempton shared last week. But in the same breath, he gives them further instructions on how they ought to live amongst outsiders, which is very evangelistic in nature. So in these verses, we see two concepts, concepts that are often pitted against each other, especially in our heavily polaristic society. In verse five, we see this concept of walking, which often denotes our lifestyle. Then it shifts to speech, emphasizing the importance of how we use our words. These two are meant to complement one another, but like I previously mentioned, they can often be two ditches that we fall in. It frequently plays out a little something like this. You, you, you will hear certain things like, man, you don't really have to say much. If you just live like Jesus lived and do as he did, you let your life speak for itself. True. Or we get this. We need to speak up. We need to share our faith. We need to be bold. But sometimes we don't necessarily have the life to back it up. These two things are equally important and play a vital role in how the world sees us. So let's look at verse five. It says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. So let me deal with this word walk real quick. In Greek, the word walk here is peripateo, which means to conduct one's life, to make one's progress or way, to regulate one's life. Paul uses this word numerous times throughout the New Testament letters, but he specifically uses it four times in the book of Colossians. This passage is one of those passages he uses it in. But every time he uses it, he's referring to how we conduct ourselves. Look in chapter one, verses nine through 10. He says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to, here it is, walk in the manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And that is a powerful and beautiful prayer. Um, it's so rich. But here, Paul is saying, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord or conduct your life, make your progress or way, or to regulate your life in a way that is worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Then in chapter two, verse six, he says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Here's that word again, peripateo, conduct your life, make your progress, Make your way, regulate your, your life 
in him. Since you've received him, now walk in him or live your life in him. Then in chapter three, verse seven, he says, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. Now he's referring to the works of the flesh that uh, I preached on a few weeks back. I'm talking about anger, wrath, malice, and sexual immorality, and all of these things that he mentioned in that, in that passage. So he's saying you too once walked in them, meaning that you conducted your life, or you made uh, your, your you regulated your your life, and you made progress in the way of these sinful things. He said you used to do that when you were living in them, and see there's a direct connection between lifestyle, walking and living. The two coincide together. So we see that Paul cares about how the church is living and walking. So back to verse five, verse five, excuse me. Walk in wisdom. The word wisdom in the Greek translates to Sophia, which means Wisdom that is broad and full of intelligence. The use of knowledge of very diverse matters, knowledge of things human and divine, acquired by acuteness and experience. Essentially, what he's saying is conduct your life in a way that refl reflects Christ, but is smart, it's intelligent, and it garners your experiences spiritual and natural to be an effective witness to outsiders. Well, why is this important? Why is it important that we live in a way that is smart and that is intelligent and in a way that uses our spiritual and natural experiences to be an effective witness to outsiders? Well, we must understand that during this time um, in the church or in, in Colossae, there were distorted accounts of Christian conduct and beliefs circulating around. And so remember, there's these false teachings of the worship of angels. Then you had the Judaizers who were trying to uphold um, laws of the old covenant. Then you had some who were mixing immoral behaviors. And then you had others who were practicing these rigorous religious rituals, not in the strength of the spirit, but in the strength of their own flesh, to appear um, as stronger or more disciplined in their faith. So just like then, today in our society, we are facing a myriad of different issues and people don't know what to believe because so many Christians have opinions and lives that sometimes um, doesn't line up with the word of God. I mean, we have issues about this pandemic, differing views on it and how we should go about it, how we should handle it. There are different views and um, opinions on race and all of the injustices and things that we've been seeing in the news um, and even in our history. Um, I mean, there's issues of homosexuality and, and views on sexuality and all of these different things um, that we see in our society that is uh, bringing so much attention, but also conflict um, in our churches. But look, <laughs> I say all that to say is that, you know what, we're human beings, so of course we won't be perfect. But here's the thing. Whether we want to or not, our lives communicate what we value. Let me say that again. Whether we want it to or not, our lives, how we live, how we conduct ourselves, communicates what we value. Well, you might be asking like, okay, what are some practical ways to navigate walking in wisdom towards outsiders? Well, I first want to just go back and say, it's very, very important that we study to show ourselves approved, that we are very familiar with the word of God, um, that we are intentional about seeking to understand it, 
The Bible says in all thy getting, get understanding um, and acquire that knowledge so that we'll be able to answer, that we'll be able to communicate, that we'll be able to live our life in such a way that reflects Christ. Um, but I want to use this example. Um, I think it's I think it's right for us to be morally strong as believers, but I think that we could be morally strong, which I, 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 I believe is, is good um, versus being holier than thou. And so let me give you an example. Maybe you have some friends or some co-workers uh, that you used to hang out with or that you currently hang out with um, that go to places that are not conducive to your spiritual health. And while you're at work, you know, you're able to have conversations with them. You're able to talk with them, um, relate to them. But then they may invite you to this space that you're not comfortable going to. Well, because of your convictions and because of what Jesus has done in your heart, you're like, you know what? Um, hey, guys, I'm just going to pass on this um, and I'll see you tomorrow at work. Right. Um, I think that's in uh, just. I think that's just being, you know, morally strong, being solid in what you believe, but without condemning anybody else versus being holier than thou. Well, it would be a difference if you communicated that same thing to your coworkers, but then you started to condemn them and made them feel bad. Like, hey, y'all shouldn't be going there. Like, don't you know that this is detrimental to your health? Don't you know that this is not good for you? And start saying things to make them feel uncomfortable or make them feel judged so that you can feel better about yourself. Well, we have to be careful um, and use wisdom in how we deal with unbelievers, our unbelieving friends, our unbelieving family members. Although we want to stand in solidarity on the things that we believe in the word, we also want to have grace. We also want to have nuance with how we deal with them so that they don't feel judged. So they, they still feel attracted and want to be around us which opens up doors for conversations, which leads me to my next point um, with speech. But before I go there, I want to deal with making the best use of time. I, I really believe that this means discerning which opportunities. Um, well, let me read it. OK, I believe that making the best use of time just simply means discerning which opportunities will best engage believers, discerning which opportunities will best engage unbelievers. Sometimes we just have to discern what opportunities will be best in how we engage unbelievers, right? Like, hmm, will having a conversation at work be better or would having a conversation, maybe going out to lunch or is it wise for me to go to this place? That's not good for my spiritual health in order to witness to them. Um, or would this person feel comfortable coming to church yet? Right. It's like discerning. OK, where is this person at um, discerning? How can I use this or utilize this to be effective? in their lives. And sometimes we just have to depend on the spirit and ask for wisdom so that we can uh, so that we can be a, a, a proper witness and help them understand the hope that we have. This leads to verse six, which talks about speech. So we just dealt with walking in wisdom, how we live our lives, how we conduct ourselves when we are with outsiders. Now it goes to our speech and it says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You know what is so interesting about how we use our words? This is addressed many times throughout the New Testament, but most of the scriptures on speech are found in Old Testament wisdom literature. Get that wisdom literature, right? Walk in wisdom. And then it goes to speech. Remember, I talked about how the two coincide together. 
but it's just so interesting to me that most of the speech scriptures that we see are found in Proverbs. And then the most explicit passage on the tongue in the New Testament is found in James, which is considered the wisdom literature of the New Testament. But I want to share some of the scriptures on speech and how we use our tongue in the Old Testament. So we see Proverbs 15, 1 through 2. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. Here it is, Proverbs 15, 4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Here we go. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Uh, there are many more, but this is the last one I'll read. Proverbs 17, 27. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man or a woman of understanding. I like that. <laughs> that he who restrains his words has a cool spirit, is a person of understanding. So let's have a cool spirit. Let's be cool people. So what is this verse saying? Okay. What is this verse saying? Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Well, I would say that it is saying to converse with unbelievers or like my man Kempton says, conversate with gracious charm and wit. Right. Don't be so stale. Loosen up a bit. Uh, you know, often we just forget to utilize the art of conversation, like being polite, smiling making good and appropriate eye contact. These are helpful tips in just carrying on a casual conversation. But look, I'm sure that at some point, all of us have been thrown off by a person's tone or comment who probably meant well, but it came off totally different. So basically what I'm saying is try not to be that girl. Try not to be that guy with dealing with unbelievers. We have to use wisdom watch our words and understand um, and discern our uh, surroundings. You know, it's funny. He says, let your words be seasoned with salt. And in my creative mind, I couldn't help but to think about seasoning and, um, you know, when you're seasoning food, so it, it will taste good and flavor it. And so me and my wife, Quita, we, we have this kind of joke that, she over seasons and not under season. And so I just prefer that you would season food a, a little bit, um, not as much so that if you need more that you can add it, because if you, if you season it too much, then you can't, you can't season it down. And so sometimes she gets it right. And other times it can be like really, really salty. And I remember a time I was just sharing with her um, this week where I came home from work a couple years ago and I was hungry. And I was like, hey, babe, you know, can you make me some eggs? And she made me some eggs and it tasted like she poured the whole thing of salt in the eggs. They were so salty that she made another batch and mixed them in and they still were salty. So essentially what I'm bringing that witness or that story into play is because we don't want to overdo it. Right. Uh, and, and be so um, 
careful or we don't want to say too much, right? To try to uh, relate um, or uh, understand unbelievers. Like we, we have to just use wisdom and we have to be careful. Uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. And so also I, I do want to deal again with being gracious, really just being thoughtful, um, being careful, being loving with our words as well. Uh, that's important. I mean, how we talk to people, um, how we treat them, um, how we interact with them is very, very important as believers. And, uh, and, and, and it is a vital in how we conduct our, uh, and how we conduct ourselves. And so, like I mentioned previously, is that whether we wanted to or not, people are watching us. They're taking cues from us. And so how we talk to people and how we treat them is so vitally important because it really gives evidence of our witness in who we follow. So let's just use this example, right? Just let's make it practical. OK, and I think it's the difference between being relatable versus being too common. Maybe you're around believers um, just like Jesus would be right. Uh, tax collectors, prostitutes, right? Criminals, all of this. Jesus was around sinners because he loved them. Um, but let's just say you're around maybe your co-workers, maybe family, maybe friends. And they're having a conversation where they're joking and um, making some inappropriate comments. Um, and you're just kind of like on the outskirts. Well, maybe there's something that you can relate, you know, in their conversation that's not as inappropriate. And you say, oh, man, I can relate to that, man. I remember this time when this happened. And oh, man, this was crazy. Right. So you're able to have nuance and talk and relate without engaging in the inappropriate parts of the conversation. But I think we have to be careful um, not to cross over the line and then become too common. So it's like, yeah, I'm being relatable, but then you can be too common by starting to jump in on the inappropriate comments or um, conversation. And then that could potentially damage your witness, could potentially damage your effectiveness um, and how um, damage your effect, uh, effectiveness and how you reach them. And so we got to be careful in how we use our words. Um, we want to be relatable, but we don't want to be too common, right? We, we don't want to get caught in the trap of trying to be too cool, right? Um, because Jesus, even though he was around sinners, he never compromised his walk and they listened to him, right? Because he was such a loving and compassionate person, right? He wasn't judgmental, right? He was there for them. Um, he, he, he was there to listen to them and to serve them, um, but he didn't compromise who he was. And so in the same way, we have to live like Jesus lived, right? We, we are not of the world, but we are in the world. So it's important that we walk in such a way that reflects Jesus and his compassion and his love, but that we're also walking in a, a, or upholding a standard that is consistent with the word of God. But you might be asking like, OK, you know, is every situation the same? No, it's not. That's why um, in this verse, it says, so, you know how you ought to answer each person. Right. Well, we have to be careful. And that's where the wisdom piece comes in. That's where depending on the spirit comes in is we're praying and we're asking the spirit to help us and give us wisdom because every person is not the same. There'll be some people that you'll be able to be more forward with. Um, there'll be some people that you may have to frame your words a little bit differently in order for them to receive um, what you're saying. Um, there'll be some people who um, just don't want to hear what you have to say at all. And so you have to know when to back up and, and, and you have to know when to just remove yourself from certain conversations in order to maintain a peaceful environment. And so um, <laughs> and we as Christians have to be careful as well not to be like overly spiritual around people who um, don't know the Lord. 
right? Um, it's this term called Christianese, right? Where it's just like a language that Christians have, you know, hey, I'm blessed and highly favored and, um, and God is good and he's wonderful and awesome. And, you know, different things that we say um, that are good when we are around our brothers and sisters, but people who don't know the Lord may not understand like that language or that jargon. And so we have to be careful not to use these deep theological terms and stuff that people may not understand um, and use layman's terms like talk regularly, like like I mentioned before, having conversations. Um, so people feel comfortable and free to have a conversation, to engage in a dialogue with you. And you know what's amazing is that when you can exhibit that discipline or learn to do that, you will find that you will be more effective um, and have more opportunities to witness to people because you, they can relate to you. Even though you're different and even though you're set apart, they're like, man, that's somebody that I can talk to. That's somebody that I can confide in and they'll listen to you, right? They'll, they'll, they'll say, hey, you know what? What do you think about this? I see that you don't go to this place um, with us when we go out, or I see that, you know, on your lunch break that you're reading certain books, um, or you, you carry yourself in such a way, or I see how you treat people. I see how you talk to your wife. I see how you love your kids. Like, Hey, what is that about? And then you have an opportunity, right? To give an answer with wisdom, right? With love, with, with grace and, and season with salt. That's why this is so, so very, very important. How we live our lives, how we walk, the talk is vital in our witness and our testimony to those who don't know us. And it's important because like in the book of Colossians, so much was going on, right? All this all these false religions and teachings are going on. And Paul had to straighten up and say, Jesus, all Jesus, everything. Because he wants us to have a solidarity in who Christ is. So that when people from the outside are curious or they want to know that we can answer um, precisely as best as we can, depending on the Holy Spirit. So I want to use this. Last illustration um, in regards to walking the talk. I know like me personally, I don't want to deal with somebody who talks a lot, but doesn't have the game to back it up. Um, and so I've grown up playing sports most of my life. Um, and I really enjoy playing basketball. And uh, many times, you know, I've play the pickup game or uh, come into a gym and there's people on the sideline and you got that one guy who's like, yo, man, I'm about to get out here and I'm about to show them what's up. You know, like my jumper is good and, you know, I got handles and my passes are on point, right? And so I'm like, okay, man, this dude, you know, talking like he can really play. But then once we get on the floor, what you see is... <laughs> A plethora of missed shots and passes and turnovers going out of bounds. Um, and then you're like, hold on, man. You talked a good game, but your actual game doesn't really line up. <laughs> and so in our lives, it's no different. You know, I use that as just a, a comical illustration. But, man, it applies to us as well. Like, I don't want to be the person that can talk a good game, but my life is not consistent with what I'm saying. And I understand that that can be incredibly difficult. Um, and even for me personally, that can be hard sometimes. It's like we know what to say, we know what to do, but often we fail um, to act that out um, and to practically live that out. And so I just want to encourage you today. Um, if you're feeling discouraged, like, man, I'm really having a hard time walking my faith out. Um, maybe you're experiencing some loss. Um, maybe you just feel distant from the Lord and from the body. I just want to encourage you keep walking, like right? 
Surround yourself around people who love Jesus and will push you into his arms. But keep going. Like, don't give up. I know it gets hard sometimes. And I know that it feels like, you know, you're not making progress. But I just want to encourage you today to keep going, to keep walking. God is faithful. Um, his grace is sufficient in your weakness. And he will uphold you. So walk the talk. God bless you.
all of my worship. Receive my worship.